Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Again, I am your host, Jesse Forrester, and this is Hashtag Find the Pioneer talk show series, where we look for young and enterprising people as well as companies that are paving the way in the field of sustainability. The Zion Sustainability Prize application is open. We have less than 30 days to go for the applications, and I want to encourage you to apply. You never know, you might just be the winner we are looking for. So this, uh, today's discussion, I am joined by a really uh, great leader, Mr. Habib El Habad, a coordinator of the Global Program of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment and Land-Based Activities for the UNEP. Welcome, Mr. Habib. Thank you. And we we're just having a nice discussion before we started about you know, the marine impact and also the impact of sand. And I think we'll get to learn a little bit more about something that we as ordinary people don't usually think about when it comes down to, you know, the ocean and marine activities. So let's get right to it, Mr. Habib. My first question for you is, can you begin telling us more about the global program of action for the protection of the marine environment and what it aims to achieve? Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, sitting. It's my pleasure to be with you. I'm, uh, as uh, our hosts have said, uh, the coordinator of a global program of action for the protection of the marine environment from land-based activities, which is commonly known as the GPA. It was created in 1995 and endorsed by the Washington Declaration. It is a unique intergovernmental program uh, that aims to tackle the land-based sources of pollution using the source to sea approach. It is an international non-legally binding instrument. It is designed primarily to uh, guide and assist governments uh, to, ta to take national and international actions to address the marine pollution from land-based activities. And you, you know that 80% of the pollution going into the uh, marine environment is coming from land-based uh, sources. The program recognizes the responsibility and the experience of international organizations and institutions, and uh, 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 including the non-governmental uh, organization, the NGOs, with, with respect to prevention reduction uh, and control of impacts upon the marine environment from one or more of the sources categories of land-based activities. Of course, since uh, 2012, uh, we have focused on three sources categories of pollution that are strictly uh, interlinked, uh, basically the marine litter, the nutrient management, and the wastewater. The program is run through a secretariat that is hosted here in the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi. We focus our resources on addressing these priorities, sources, categories, by uh, working together with the governments, intergovernmental agencies, academia, private sector, and civil society through three major multi-stakeholder partnerships. The Global Partnership on uh, Marine Litter, the Global Partnership on Nutrient Management, as well as the Global uh, Wastewater Initiative. And we focus our work uh, on tackling the many challenges related to the wastewater management, addressing wastewater pollution, as well as nutrients management and plastic and microplastics. We do that through um, demonstration projects uh, for policy making research tools but also uh, sensitizing the relevant stakeholders and the public at large through outreach uh, materials webinars uh, massive open online courses and we uh, also work on the topic of emerging pollutants pharmaceuticals and microplastic in wastewater that's in uh, in short what we do so, as, ladies, you can see that's in short um, <laughs> what, what they cover. And it's very interesting that, you know, we have a body that's actually pushing for this. And sometimes, you know, when 
we see a lot of bad in the world. We don't realize that there are some organizations and some people pushing to do great good um, in the community. And it's very interesting because this theme for today's discussion is about water. And as you know, you know, I won the Zaya Sustainability Prize in 2019 for the Global High Schools category about water and wastewater in particular. And I'm a bit biased uh, with Mr. Habib because I'm from Nairobi. And uh, I love that we are actually having a sort of a developmental organization centered within a developing country. And that is super important, I think, for the future of what it's going to look like. So, Mr. Habib, you talked about pollution. And in recent years, there has been a huge drive from celebrities and activists alike to clean up oceans. With many governments reinforcing this trend by passing new policies that ban single-use plastics in particular, there have been many activities surrounding these movements and perhaps they have made a certain dent for the better um, to marine and ocean life. That being said, usage of single-use plastics has unfortunately spiked since the pandemic started. What call to action can our audience partake in during and after this pandemic to keep driving progress forward? Well, indeed, considerable, as you said, considerable progress has been achieved worldwide. Uh, last couple of years to ban the single-use plastic and to limit the um, continuous load of plastics into the sea. And uh, uh, Kenya is to be uh, commended uh, because they have banned uh, uh, the single-use uh, plastic bags uh, now for more than a year, uh, and it's working very well. However, as uh, you rightly said, uh, with this pandemic hitting the whole world, uh, we start seeing uh, more and more horrific pictures, in fact, of not only tons of plastics, but also all sorts of medical uh, waste thrown all over the place. Uh, there are already some reports, uh, I think, from um, Hong Kong, where people monitoring uh, beaches have noticed an increase in masks uh, and gloves uh, oh, around yes. around the the uh, beaches, uh, the same uh, in uh, European cities uh, such as in Paris and other capitals. I was watching yesterday a, a reportage on uh, on the TV. I mean, you can see uh, uh, hundreds of masks and other single-use plastic materials are found just on the streets. This is going to be really another disaster uh, if we continue like that, when we know especially that a, a surgical mask will take hundreds of years to disintegrate in nature. We should, where possible, really continue to monitor and, uh, and learn uh, from what we are seeing during this unprecedented uh, uh, situation, uh, take stock and learn for the future. Uh, of course, uh, one say the safety and health of people should be uh, the pri priority, basically. However, we must be equipped with the best knowledge uh, to critically examine the statements promoting the increase in single-use or excessive plastic packaging use uh, as a solution to this uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation. Uh, prevention and reduction of the use of plastic um, is of course key as this is more efficient than uh, cleanup if your objective is to reduce basically the marine litter. Uh, you should always of course critically examine the need for any particular plastic uh, product depending on the context that uh, uh, you will use it uh, in and uh, as well as what environmentally sound alternatives there might be to mitigate uh, this increase. If you do use it Basically, proper disposal is essential to reduce uh, any risk uh, of the product ending up in the environment. Uh, one, one more issue that uh, we need also to take care, and this is something that came up recently, is uh, that uh, some industries are also trying to revert or hold uh, uh, legislation uh, to ban certain types of plastic. Uh, as a protection against the virus, and this, I've I've seen a, a an article in New York Times uh, recently, and this is really has to be taken uh, uh, very carefully because uh, this is this is an issue of concern that will completely destroy all what we have been doing over the years to ban 
uh, and to uh, decrease the load of uh, uh, plastics in the sea. Yeah. I think I think you're right, and there actually has been a serious concern with all the other speakers that have come on about us losing in terms of gains towards the SDGs and towards actually getting sustainability as the key objective that we're achieving. Because you know, before the coronavirus, um, climate change was and still is an existential threat uh, to the human race. And so, you know, you know sorry, excuse me. As much as we have seen a reduction in air pollution, we've definitely seen a spike in other types of pollution. And it's very good that you're highlighting, you know, kind of what's going on and what has spiked. Like I did not know that a surgical mask left um, in nature will take a hundred years plus to decompose. Uh, that is absolutely stunning, especially with how much uh, surgical equipment is been going on and is, the pollution is just, it's crazy. So you had also talked yeah. a little bit now about how industry leaders are pushing um, so for change and to ban uh, plastic use. And so what are some emerging innovative sustainability trends that you think we will see more of in the next two years when it comes to preventing marine litter, specifically plastics and microplastics? Well, I would say the use of digital tools, uh, including the artificial intelligence and machine-based uh, learning to connect data as well as stakeholders to promote action and cooperation. We are already exploring opportunities uh, with IBM uh, company for a pilot development uh, of a digital platform together with the science policy-based forum uh, that we have here in uh, in UNEP. A global town hall, in fact, will be um, held uh, in June, mid-June, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So we invite you, of course, to join that to learn more about this. It will be uh, uh, a webinar based. And uh, uh, such tools may provide, of course, opportunities uh, to promote evidence-based action as well as um, measuring the impact of different uh, interventions through data analysis and reporting. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, also uh, work stream is um, putting more attention to solving the issue of uh, uh, microplastic uh, in wastewater. These are mm -hmm. the, the small particles uh, of less than five millimeter that can easily find their ways uh, into our waterways through wastewater. Uh, they, uh, they also end up in the, in the sludge, which is often used in agriculture. Hence, they also have the potential to uh, contaminate the soil. On this matter, um, within our, uh, our program, we are working on a toolkit uh, of options catalog to assess the present of the uh, plastics and microplastics and microfibers uh, in the wastewater um, and their removal. It's, uh, it's really uh, meant to help the policy makers uh, making the right decision to tackle this problem. These are two, uh, two uh, main work stream that I see uh, there is a benefit in the, in the next couple of years to to work with. Yeah. You know, actually, um, speaking about microplastics, my, uh, my mom actually doesn't let me eat fish anymore because she's really worried about the <laughs> contamination of my, you know, mothers can be. So it is yeah, something yeah. that we do need to solve um, because it, it does affect us all and will have long-term effects. And I noticed you mentioned about fertilizer and that actually leads down to our fourth question for you is, you know, fertilizer runoff from agricultural from agriculture poses a similar problem that is causing contamination of large water bodies um, to the detriment of land and marine life alike. Can you tell us more about the efficient nutrient management and how it can be applied not only to help prevent this type of pollution, but also to increase profitability for smallholder farmers? Yeah. Uh... Many, many sub-Saharan African farmers, in fact, struggle to, ac to uh, access enough nutrients for quality crop uh, production. Uh, 
Yes. While in the developed world and several rapidly developing uh, regions of uh, South and uh, East Asia, there is the problem of excessive nutrient use, which is triggering a, a web of unforeseen uh, consequences. Uh, the excessive use of phosphorus, uh, for example, is not only uh, depleting uh, finite supplies, but triggering water pollution locally and beyond. Uh, while the excessive use of nitrogen and the uh, production of the nitrogen uh, compounds is triggering the threat uh, not only to fresh water, uh, but the air and, uh, and the soils uh, with consequences on uh, climate change uh, and biodiversity. So the, the excessive nitrogen and the phosphorus in coastal waters uh, has indeed triggered uh, coastal eutrophication uh, mm -hmm. which was, uh, which has recently emerged as a global uh, issue of serious concern with a, a steady growth in the extent uh, of persistent uh, of eutrophic, uh, hydroxic and anoxic coastal um, waters. Um, we have seen uh, an excessive uh, emergence of uh, weeds uh, called sargassum uh, in uh, West Africa and uh, the Caribbean, for example. And next week, uh, I think on Tuesday, the 26th of May, we will be organizing a, another webinar uh, on the sargassum uh, challenge in the Caribbean uh, region, as well as the West Africa. We will have experts from both regions talking about this and uh, of course you will be uh, uh, welcome to to uh, uh, attend it and and uh, uh, see what uh, what this is about uh, improving definitely the nutrients use efficiency uh, in crop uh, production is a win-win strategy and uh, it aims at increasing the uh, crop production uh, and optimizing the use of uh, of external uh, uh, resources. Efforts are being uh, made through uh, our work, our uh, partnership, uh, the Global Partnership on Nutrients Management, uh, on how to uh, produce more food and energy uh, with less pollution through improving the nutrient use efficiency in agriculture, uh, through one, improving the, the nutrient use efficiency in uh, crop production, and uh, improving the nutrient use efficiency in animal uh, production and increasing the, the fertilizer uh, uh, equivalence uh, value of animal uh, uh, manure. So we are, we are definitely working with the expert in different regions to look at all these uh, issues. Yeah, and that's super important because smallholder farmers account for majority of the farmers, especially here in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And it's super important that, you know, we do not sacrifice the growth of food for pollution. You know, there has to be that nice. I like what you said in terms of us moving in tandem with reducing the amount of pollution that is there and that is present, um, which I think is a really good thing. So yeah. then you talked about UNEP and specifically GPA, working with governments. So what kind of policy, government policy can help expedite the development of sustainable agricultural and manufacturing practices that protect the marine environment? And just before you go, Habib, I'd just like to invite everyone to keep asking your questions. And um, there is an open invitation to join a webinar um, that Habib's team would be organizing. And I think it's absolutely essential that you do join if you have the time and the opportunity to you will learn something and will be beneficial for you. So you are welcome. And I think that we can figure out how to get that out to people so that they can also join and maybe following UNEP and what they're working on. So yeah, yeah. back to the question, uh, what kind of government policies can help? Yeah, uh, well, roughly 80% of the um, of synthetic nitrogen we use uh, in as fertilizers uh, to grow food goes basically to waste. And much of this wasted uh, nitrogen uh, leaks into our rivers, lakes, and seas, feeding uh, the algal blooms uh, that deplete oxygen and destroy life. 
and uh, this is this uh, uh, forms all these dead zones in uh, in yeah. our oceans and these uh, dead zones have uh, quadrupled um, in in size basically uh, since 1950 uh, the largest in the baltic sea for example can reach 70000 square kilometer an area almost twice as big as uh, denmark so part of the problem has been a lack of awareness among the policy uh, makers uh, and the public. Uh, at uh, last year, uh, United Nations Environment Assembly uh, in its se on its session uh, four here in Nairobi in March 2019, governments have adopted a landmark decision on sustainable nitrogen management with support from the GPA. And this, has, uh, uh, this was followed by uh, a Colombo Declaration on Sustainable Nitrogen Management adopted in October the same year, uh, 2019, during the launch of a big global uh, campaign on nitrogen to promote awareness uh, on this issue. Uh, sets, and it sets an ambition of halving, by it, dividing by two, the nitrogen waste uh, worldwide by 2030. This is really a, a landmark decision taken by uh, the governments uh, uh, during uh, a, a, an intergovernmental meeting, a summit meeting in, uh, in Colombo, Sri Lanka. This would lead basically to immediate benefits in the fight against the climate change, basically, against uh, biodiversity loss and air pollution. Uh, it would also lead to uh, approximately uh, 100 billion US dollars in savings and foster innov innovation in sectors like the farming, uh, energy and uh, transport. So uh, policymakers will need to begin by focusing and by discussing which approaches are the most uh, basically agile, efficient, and cost-effective. They will, of course, need to focus on improving the performance of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, maybe increase the use of organic uh, fertilizers and boost, basically, the recycling uh, of nutrients from the uh, agriculture. Reducing, of course, the consumption uh, of meat <laughs> and dairy and dramatically cutting the amount of food uh, we waste would also uh, lower the nitrogen needs uh, in the agricultural uh, sector. So okay. there are already promising signs that some nations basically are already starting to wake up to this important problem. The EU, for example, the European Union's plan for a circular economy uh, aims to recycle bionutrients uh, like nitrogen back into its uh, uh, economy. Uh, India recently has called on farmers to half the uh, fertilizers used by uh, 2020. So by this year, normally, I don't know whether we will reach uh, that, but uh, definitely the Prime Minister of India was very, very uh, prominent in this. And China uh, wants to hold growth in synthetic fertilizers by next year without uh, reducing the uh, its food production. So we will see, I mean, policies are there, uh, countries are aware and uh, uh, they have taken uh, already these steps. Yeah, yeah. I think that now the tricky part will be when it comes down to that actual implementation and the execution of these policies to make them widespread. That's always the challenge, I think, when it yeah. comes down to um, sustainable policies. But I think it's also interesting that you've also touched on what other people have said, because you said that you know, there are $100 billion worth of savings that could be made and that these different innovations that uh, fill up, I think they're called institutional voids, according to Harvard. And so I think that this just goes to show young people and people watching that are interested in sustainability, that it is a trillion dollar opportunity. And this is just one of the sectors that can actually lead to $100 you know, billion of savings. So it's super important for us to get involved and to actually be the people that could help execute on government policies and make this a reality. 
Um, so my last question for you before we dive into the audience questions is um, from circular solutions to robotics, the solid and water waste management sector is showing great promise from both an economic profitability and innovation standpoint. In your opinion, what strategy is needed for organizations to gain a powerful competitive advantage to become an industry leader in this domain? I'm taking notes because um, <laughs> I'm also in this industry. So looking forward to hearing what you're saying. Well, it's in fact, it's a very interesting question. I think you are right uh, when you say that uh, the wastewater sector is showing great promise for uh, profitability. There is, however, uh, a need to spread the world. I mean, uh, uh, make organizations and private uh, sector aware that the wastewater is a rich resource and its reuse is indeed uh, profitable. We have in the past uh, produced a publication uh, highlighting uh, the economic valuation of uh, wastewater, showing that Indeed, investing in wastewater is beneficial in many ways, economically and beyond. And we are talking here about uh, blue economy, circular economy, what have you. And now we are working together with the private sector to leverage additional uh, funding to support initiatives related to tackle uh, wastewater pollution. It is definitely uh, a key to work uh, with the private sector in this effort. We cannot avoid it. To answer basically your question, uh, I think the strategy is to perhaps start from demonstration projects that show great results and gr good uh, profitability. This uh, can be replicated elsewhere on a larger scale basis. Uh, and most importantly, um, work together. These objectives can be reached um, only if we work all together for the same uh, goal. Uh, within the GPA, we do have, in fact, as I said, three key partnerships to bring uh, together the sto stakeholders from different domain uh, to join efforts in these uh, endeavors. So this is really important and i do believe that we should invest more into these small pilot projects and see whether uh, where we can replicate them we can also consider waste and recycling uh, uh, through improving nutrient efficiency for example in fertilizers and food supply uh, and reducing food uh, waste and also the recycling nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater uh, systems in cities, agriculture and industry. So there are lots of, of uh, uh, small good initiatives uh, that uh, could be uh, implemented uh, at a small scale projects uh, with the private sector and stakeholders and where we can uh, really uh, 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 show profitability and uh, uh, show the experience of circular economy where it works. Awesome. That's a very good way to cap off the questions that I have for you. And it's um, a very good call to action for us to think about because it is profitable and um, you can actually check out the PDF of where the UNEP did the research on wastewater. I think it's found on your website, um, if I'm not wrong. Awesome. So uh, we have two questions from the audience. So the first one is from Faisal. And uh, he asks, in the current uh, pandemic situation, single-use plastics are being considered as essential. And this will definitely change the mindsets of many people who had previously opposed their use. What do you think are the alternatives available to us today and in the future? How can we make this a thing of the past? Well, as I said in when I answered your que second question, I think I mean the, the 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 problem is not to use or not to use. When you have to use it, you have to find the proper way to dispose uh, of it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, okay. uh, with this pandemic, as I said, we are seeing a proliferation of masks being thrown everywhere and this is this is more a question of 
civic uh, education uh, than than any other uh, issue. I mean, the the report I've seen on the TV yesterday or two days ago uh, in Europe, for in Paris and others. I mean. You see people just removing the mask, walking on the street and throwing it uh, uh, like that. This cannot continue. I mean, as I said, uh, surgical masks can take up to 300 years to disintegrate. I mean, is this something that we would like to live uh, uh, with and to uh, have our children live with? It's, uh, of course, uh, uh, with this pandemic, some use of single-use uh, uh, plastic are uh, unavoidable, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and, and we are not here to say, no, you don't use gloves, you don't use masks, you don't use this, and you don't use that. But however, we really need to uh, make sure that there is a proper uh, disposal of these, and there is a proper uh, uh, awareness uh, of the public of what it means when they use it and they throw it uh, anywhere in the nature. Okay. And our last question is from Dalal. She asks, sustainable management of water resources and access to safe water and sanitation are essential for economic growth. How has the pandemic affected this or slowed this down? Well, Again, you know, I mean, it's it's like any other uh, uh, situation. Uh, with this pandemic, uh, we are uh, using more and more uh, water, for example, uh, to 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 clean the hands, to clean, uh, uh, to wash uh, clothes, etc. This this waste uh, uh, water that. Uh, is going to be uh, disposed of and thrown everywhere is going to affect the uh, demand and the supply, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, economic uh, uh, growth, I, I talked about the, the whole circular economy around the wastewater management, uh, the uh, water resources management, etc. Et we need to really uh, start looking seriously at our resources. Uh, it's uh, in in some part of the of the world, uh, wastewater are uh, treated and thrown completely in the sea without any uh, use uh, of of the treated water. Is it something that is sustainable on the long run? No. Uh, in some part of the water, there is no enough. Uh, uh, water uh, for for irrigation. We really need to make sure that with this pandemic, we don't lose the sustainability and the uh, uh, economic growth that we are all uh, striving uh, for uh, for the the future generation. So yes, uh, you, uh, the 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 health uh, of of uh, the population uh, is important, but we have also to uh, uh, keep an eye on the environment and on the resources in order to sustain life beyond uh, the uh, pandemic. Awesome. Those are very great words, last words. You know, we cannot let the pandemic detract us from the progress we have already made. We have to keep with it and we have to think about ways to go around it and think of ways to be robust so that you know, if anything like this happens again, you know, God forbid, there is a way that we can avoid using our, you know, our resources that are so scarce in such a wasteful way. So thank you so much, um, Habib. Thank you so much, to the UNEP, for um, agreeing to um, partner with us and join us on this call, ladies and gentlemen. Again, you know, we're looking for pioneers, and as you can see, there are multiple opportunities for you to find even during this pandemic. There are ways that you could think about changing your community, your country, and this platform that the Zaya Sustainability Prize provides is a good way for you to do that. You have access to capital to push out your projects. You also have ideas that can be taken advantage of and made great. You have a great community that you can join. 
So ladies and gentlemen, please do take this opportunity, do take this chance and do apply for the Zaya Sustainability Prize. I've been your host, Jesse Forrester in hashtag Find the Pioneer talk show series. And we'd just like you to email any info about the Pioneer to info at Zayed Sustainability Prize com with information about the pioneer thank you so much for hosting actually that should be me <laughs> thank you so much for joining us um, on this hosting session and thank you Habib again thank you very much Jesse okay see you guys take care and be safe as always thank you bye bye <laughs>